Hello, everybody. Hey there, Dr. P. How are you doing today? Doing great, Eric. How are you doing? I am doing really well with this cooler, cloudier weather. <laughs> out here. I'm feeling uh, normal. My temperature in this office is only 25.6 degrees, oh. uh, so not too bad. Um, welcome, everybody, to another Ask Dr. B Live here on YouTube, Thursdays at noon. And today we are going to cover some anterior knee pain. So um, as always, Dr. B has put together a little presentation for everybody. Uh, before we get into it, I just want to pose the question, and if you could answer in the chat, do you have anterior knee pain? So we're just curious if anybody here is dealing with anterior knee pain, which is the front of the knee. Maybe you don't know, you don't have a diagnosis. Maybe you do have a diagnosis, but you just, the front of the knee, you've got some kind of pain. Maybe it's been coming and going for a while now, and that's why you're here. So we're just curious who's got anterior knee pain. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at that after. And as always, if you have a question, post it in the chat, and I, I will serve it up to Dr. B uh, once she's done her, her presentation. So Dr. B, take it away. Awesome. Thank you very much, Eric. I'm going to get my screen share on here. Um, and... Uh, Just get, it's not behaving here. Where are we? Slideshow. So we, yes, we are going to talk about anterior knee pain today. And this is something that I find one of the most frustrating diagnoses to make as a physician and one of the most frustrating problems to deal with as an individual athlete myself. Um, so I'm going to share some of my personal experiences in dealing with anterior knee pain and the struggles that I've had, even knowing everything that I know about the musculoskeletal system. Um, I do find it a challenge, but uh, I want everybody to get a message today that there is hope that um, even if you've had this pain and it's something that's bothered you for years, that there are solutions. And one of my uh, favorite athletes, uh, Rafael Nadal, had suffered from anterior knee pain that had taken him out of the sport for quite significant periods of time over the years. And uh, he seems to be pain free right now, which is wonderful. So, you know, it, it's something that you think you're never going to get over, but there, there are solutions and things that you can do in order to, um, to uh, solve your, your pain. So today what we're gonna do is discuss why anterior pain, knee pain occurs, uh, what causes it, what are the common signs and symptoms, uh, and then what steps we can take to deal with our pain. Um, I wanted to start out with just reviewing what the anatomy at the front or anterior part of the knee is. And the anterior knee pain primarily involves issues with our extensor mechanism. So this is looking at the front of the knee uh, this is the kneecap here. This is the quadricep or thigh muscle. Uh, we've got the femur and then the tibia. So there's the knee joint line. And the um, patella uh, or kneecap is a very interesting structure. It's actually what is known as a sesamoid bone. And a sesamoid bone is actually buried within a tendon. And the job of a sesamoid bone is to increase the um, biomechanical function or leverage of the muscle that it's, that it's associated with. So the job of the patella is to improve the lever arm of the quadricep. And the quadricep as quad, four, there's four parts to the quadricep. You can see that the three superficial, uh, more superficial parts of it, this is the VMO, that's on the inside of your knee, so where your knees would be touching. Then we have the rectus femoris, and the vastus lateralis, and then there's an intermediate or fourth component, which is deep to these three heads. And I just want you to notice that these different parts of the quadricep insert on the patella. And you can imagine that if you only pulled using one of the, these three heads, you could pull the kneecap into a different direction. Then um, the patella itself uh, attaches to the tibial tuberosity, that's the lower leg bone, on the tib uh, um, through the patellar tendon. And if the quadricep muscle contracts, then the knee will extend. So that's the job of the quadricep. Now, if we look at this, um, the, un the uh, patella and um, how it articulates with the end of the thigh bone or the femur, you can see that there is a groove on the femur, and this is called the femoral trochlea. 
And there is quite a bit of congruence between the uh, patellar undersurface and the femoral trochlea. But the patella itself will glide from uh, an inferior, meaning towards your toes, to superior towards your head uh, motion as you flex and extend your knee. And if you put your hand on your knee and you bend and straighten your knee, you'll feel the patella uh, going down towards your feet as you bend the knee and then moving up towards your head as you extend your knee. So it glides along this femoral trochlear groove. And if we look at it from the side, um, it just shows how the patella is um, uh, um, at the level of the end of the thigh bone. And um, we have some other little ligaments that help to sort of act as guide, guide wires to keep the patella uh, located within its groove. There is the medial patellofemoral ligament and a lateral patellofemoral ligament. These ligaments are important primarily with um, patellar instability or dislocation. And today we're not really gonna focus too much on dislocations. We're gonna focus more on the causes of pain at the front of the knee itself. Um, so um, moving on. We um, know that there are very large contact forces underneath the kneecap. And these are highest between 45 and 90 degrees. And I, I find really it starts around 30 degrees of knee flexion. And you may actually experience this. If you have anterior knee pain, you'll notice that you're pretty good when your knee is a little straighter, but as soon as you bend your knee at around 30 degrees of knee flexion, uh, you'll start to feel some, some pain. And this is because the contact forces between the kneecap and the end of the femur increase dramatically. And you can see that uh, with normal walking, uh, the forces increase to 1.3 times body weight Going upstairs, it increases to 3.3, running 5.6, and squatting almost eight times body weight uh, force through the patella. And this is important because when you're thinking about how the patella is supposed to move, and this, this patella is not moving normally. Normally, what would happen as you bend, the patella would slide distally. And, uh, and then as you extend, the patella would uh, go up um, towards your head. But if the kneecap isn't sliding properly, then basically the kneecap gets driven into the end of the femur. And that will cause an even further increase in the contact pressure. So it's really important that the kneecap is sliding properly along the femoral trochlea with extension and flexion of the joint. And you can imagine that it, those three heads uh, or the four heads of the quadricep, if that muscle is too tight and um, uh, doesn't allow the kneecap to move inferiorly as you flex the knee, then it's gonna hold the kneecap in this position. So what I find happens very commonly with anterior knee pain is we lose this normal balance and sliding of the patella uh, in its femoral trochlear groove. And you can imagine that if you had the patella centered and just moving the way it should be, there's no excessive wear on the patellar surface. But you compare that to a patella that is not centered in its trochlear groove, you're going to have abnormal or asymmetric load on the joint surface and on the soft tissues around that patella. These um, asymmetrical loads are really high and they're eventually going to lead to breakdown. So what tissue is overloaded or inflamed with anterior knee pain? There, there can be a whole variety of, um, of tissues that are involved and these tissues can be involved on that spectrum of wear and tear from microscopic wear and tear to macroscopic damage. And you may have heard of terms such as uh, con patellar chondromalacia. Well, chondromalacia is referring to the cartilage that's on the undersurface of the patella. And there's grades of this um, cartilage damage, which range from softening of the cartilage uh, to then a, a blistering, finally a fibrillation, um, so that the cartilage, instead of being smooth and glistening, starts to look like a shag rug, to complete 
loss of the articular cartilage underneath the patella. Um, that is actually in and, of, in and of itself not a painful condition because cartilage doesn't have a nerve supply. So it's the effects of the load on the cartilage and the bone together because We've got the patella, which is the bone, which is covered by articular cartilage. And the bone that is underneath um, or supporting that cartilage is affected by the overload. And so I've seen um, in patients on an MRI that they may have what we call a bone bruise or bone contusion. And that tells me that there's a lot of metabolic activity within the, the bone itself. And um, that, in it, that can be associated with pain. Um, the, the tendons, the quadricep tendon, so where the quad inserts on the superior pole of the patella, or the patellar tendon at the inferior pole of the patella, these tissues, because of um, imbalances, can lead um, or can have uh, micro tears and progress to partial or full thickness tearing, very rare full thickness tears um, in these wear and tear situations. But um, the, the, these, um, the breakdown of the tissue can lead to tendonitis. Uh, so there can be inflammation associated with the breakdown of the collagen. And similarly with the tendonitis where you may get a little bit of swelling where the tendon inserts into the bone. Um, with, if the cartilage is damaged, we may see swelling in the knee when the cartilage actually breaks up and little piece, pieces of this float into the knee and that causes an inflammatory response. Um, ligament injuries, uh, we're not really going to discuss, as I mentioned, um, this is sort of a, a, a bit of a separate entity, but if anybody watching does suffer from recurrent dislocation of their patella, the principles that we're talking about on how to unload the patella will be very beneficial for you. Uh, the synovium, uh, there's been studies done that, uh, where, where people have injected freezing into the synovium around the patella. Uh, to try to eliminate pain and, uh, or on the, on the converse, instead of putting freezing in there, they've actually stimulated that synovial lining to uh, replicate anterior knee pain. And certainly synovial tissue can create pain that mimics the distribution that we commonly see with uh, pain at the front of the knee. Uh, the, there's a bursa is a small fluid filled sac that allows tissues to glide over one another. So there is one that's directly over top of your kneecap so that the skin on your knee can slide easily over the patella and you can just press down on, your, on, the, on the skin over your kneecap and you can feel how you can move the skin um, across your kneecap. And this can become inflamed. And this isn't the typical anterior knee pain that we're talking about today. This is something that's known as housemaid's knee. Uh, because housemaids tend to kneel a lot and there can be pressure directly on the bursa, which leads to inflammation, inflammation and, um, and pain. And then finally, you can have the fat pad that is associated with the patellar tendon and the patella itself. This is a structure that is within the knee. Everybody has it. Um, and the fat pad, if it becomes inflamed due to, say, the patellar tendonitis, the fat pad can stick to the tendon, it can hypertrophy or get larger, and then occasionally it can pinch a bit between the femoral trochlea and the patella and cause pain. But all of these um, tissues, regardless of which tissue is affected by, um, uh, by the overload, are, are really um, a, a problem of our movement mechanics and overloading the front of the knee. And so the treatment is often very similar from a movement perspective. Now the classic anterior knee pain symptoms are pain at the front of the knee, pain after sitting for any period of time. Uh, we talk about, uh, you know, do you have, we always ask, I remember when I was a medical student, actually, we would be asked to, you know, ask the patient, do they have pain after they get up from a movie? And um, this was a sign of patellofemoral knee pain, uh, the movie theater sign, or after sitting at a long flight, um, pain uh, going up and down stairs, particularly downstairs because it's an eccentric contraction, uh, pain with lunging and squatting. And occasionally there's a giving way type of feeling, um, more of a weakness than a pain or, or giving way that's associated with a ligament injury. Um, what happens is that if you take a step and you get a sharp pain around your kneecap, then the quad can shut off and you feel like you're going to fall. 
Um, and this is more of uh, the impingement um, or just overload, acute overload of the tissues, which results in the muscles shutting down versus uh, in giving way due to a ligament injury like an ACL. And occasionally there may be catching at the, at the front of the knee. Um, often this pain is brought about by changes in activity. So an increase in either intensity or duration of, the, of your sport or starting up a new sport. Um, and change in footwear has been commonly um, associated with the development of anterior knee pain. So what do I look for? So I look um, both locally, and so what I mean there is I examine the knee, and then I look dist at distant sites, the hip and the ankle. And what I'm primarily looking for um, locally is how does, the, how does the patella track, how does the kneecap move within that uh, femoral trochlea? Does it stay lined up? Um, is, it, uh, is, the, is the individual um, predisposed to a problem because of the way that their legs are lined up? Um, there's, a, I shouldn't, I, I have a bit of a problem with how they've labeled this as normal. To me, knock need can be normal because it's the way you're born and I'm normally bow-legged, so I consider that normal. Um, but the alignment of your femur and your tibia can change the Q angle, which is the angle, if you look over here, the angle that the patellar tendon inserts into the tibial tuberosity. And there is evidence that the greater the Q angle, the more likely you are to have tracking issues. And you can see that if, you're, if your patellar tendon it goes off uh, at an angle, instead of going straight up and down, you're more likely to have run into issues because the patella has to kind of veer off slightly to the side anyways with, with motion. So um, I look at how the patella tracks. I look at the balance of the soft tissue. I actually hold on to the patella and you can test this on yourself. You have to have your quadricep relaxed. So your knee has to be completely straight and you just grab onto the kneecap and you can move it from side to side and up and down to see whether it moves equally on the sore side compared to the non sore side. And then um, I look at whether the individual is able to contract their vastus medialis. And this is a really controversial thing. If you actually read the literature, a lot of uh, rehab specialists don't really put much credence into the function of the VMO. Um, I personally do because of my clinical experience. Um, after surgery, I found that, and, and this is surgery, not necessarily for patellofemoral issues, but say an ACL tear or for uh, a meniscus tear that I've done in arthroscopy. Um, I would immediately have patients working on getting their vastus medialis contracting. And I was really particularly interested in having them initiate their quadricep contraction with the VMO. And I found when people were successful in doing this, that they got less swelling. When they got less swelling, they got less pain. When they had less pain and swelling, the range of motion came back uh, more effectively. And um, I think that the VMO is a really important initiator and main um, initiator of uh, extension, but also helps to maintain um, good function uh, of the quadricep and the adductor mechanism. And also it works and talks with some of our hip muscles so that you, in order for the VMO to be functioning well, this kinetic chain connection needs to be uh, working effectively. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the rehabilitation exercises. So basically I'm looking for that foundation for movement, the alignment of the patella, how it tracks, uh, what are the balances of the soft tissues? Is, it, is the patella mobile? And is the VMO functioning? I also look for signs of swelling. And the relevance here is that, first of all, if you've got a big, large effusion in your knee, you really need to see the doctor to make sure that there aren't other issues causing the swelling, such as a meniscus tear, or that you did dislocate your kneecap, or you have an ACL injury. It's very rare to actually have any swelling in the knee with patellofemoral issues. It can happen, and I personally have had it. And I think that the swelling will uh, come in response to a little damage to the cartilage underneath the patella, which causes an inflammatory response. But um, it, to me, swelling is a sign that there's something going on inside the joint that is um, significant and uh, is something that needs to, be to, needs to be investigated a little further. More um, localized swelling. So if you um, have patellar tendonitis, for example, you may have a little bit of swelling right where the patellar tendon and on this individual, you can see here's the patella 
And then here is the patellar tendon and the tibial tuberosity. And it's easier to see if you flex the knee up, but when you flex the knee up, if somebody has patellar tendonitis, there'll be maybe a little bit of swelling right where the patella inserts onto the kneecap and it'll be very tender. Uh, it might be like, it'll look like a little bump. Um, so I look for that. Uh, and if there's a bit of quadriceps tendonitis, similarly, you, the quadriceps tendon, you can see the tendon inserting on the patella here. You may see uh, or feel a little bit of inflammation or induration. So there's evidence of micro tearing or possible partial tearing with uh, inflammatory response here. And the reason I want to know about that is that for the relaxed phase of recovery, we would want to uh, um, focus our uh, anti-inflammatory measures and tissue pliability uh, towards those parts of the joint that could be damaged. And I guess the third part that I commonly find um, there may be a bit of inflammation or evidence of micro damage is the iliotibial band. The iliotibial band comes, uh, this is the lateral quadriceps. You can see the iliotibial band right here and it comes and inserts on the proximal portion of the tibia. And if it's inflamed, it's often right in this area here. It may feel a little thick and tender uh, and uh, it will adhere to the vastus lateralis. So it's important from a physical examination standpoint to understand where there's potentially a little tissue damage and inflammation um, with the anterior knee pain. Uh, I don't routinely get investigations the first time I see somebody who's had anterior knee pain, uh, but if they've had pain for years and years, then for sure I will get an x-ray uh, and or uh, an MRI. But the big caveat with this is um, you can find things that really are meaningless. So for example, this is an AP of the knee. This is looking at the distal femur. This is the proximal tibia. This is the knee joint with an excellent cartilage space. Here is the patella. And you can see this line on the patella. And what this is, is it's not a fracture. You might think it's a fracture, um, but what it is is actually the uh, growth plate from where the patella started to grow. And this growth plate didn't fuse so this is known as a bipartite patella. And sometimes uh, people will read this if they're not experienced or if the radiologist hasn't been given a history of, the, of what's going on with your knee and say, oh my God, there's a fracture. And the next thing you know, you're having surgery and there's no need for surgery. Sometimes a bi bipartite patella can be painful. Uh, you'll know that because you'll have tenderness directly over this part of the patella. And you may actually feel that little fragment moving. Um, but it's a very rare cause. Uh, and it's more common that we find the bipartite patella with no symptoms associated at all. The, sorry, the, um, the lateral view can give us some idea as to the height of the patella, but I often can tell that just from the clinical examination. And, um, but if there is, uh, some people have very high riding patella, it's called patella alta. And those individuals are often uh, susceptible to the instability issue. And occasionally, particularly after surgery, the patella may be pulled lower than it should be. And it's um, because that fat pad has become very fibrotic and has captured the patella and prevents it from going in a superior inferior direction. The, um, I show this uh, for the MRI. We can actually see the cartilage underneath the kneecap really nicely. The black line is the subchondral bone and the gray is the articular cartilage. And it's, it's so common that the articular cartilage underneath the kneecap is abnormal that I don't really pay a lot of attention to that. If there is some edema, and in this lower view, we can see some this white signal that tells me that there's some edema. Now, this edema is not on the joint surface, but more on uh, in the area where the patellar, um, uh, sorry, the quadriceps tendon would be inserting. So this would indicate to me that there is some potential stress reaction from the quadriceps tendon. Um, but when I do see that edema uh, on an MRI, it very often is associated with anterior knee pain. So you, the caveat here, if you get an MRI, just because you have some damage to the cartilage doesn't mean you need an operation. Um, X-rays will also show us how the kneecap is tracking within the groove. And this is a, a skyline view. This is very dependent upon the position your knee is put in when the X-ray is taken. And there's very special protocols that are used in order to get a good result. But you can see here how the kneecap is very congruent with the femoral trochlea. And there's a beautiful space here that would be filled with articular cartilage. 
and we can't see the cartilage on the plain x-ray. But we can imagine that if the patella has shifted laterally, if you got the x-ray and the patella is sitting where this outline is, that there is that asymmetrical load and that the cartilage here would be damaged, just like the picture of the uh, ball bearing spinning. It's going to be in an imbalanced position versus over here where it's balanced. And other, um, another view, um, image we may see is that the patella actually tilts to the side. And um, this is because we often have tightening of the lateral structures, the iliotibial band, the vastus lateralis, and then um, the, the kneecap is, is tilted. And I test the mobility of the kneecap by actually trying to tip the kneecap up on its side. And uh, it's kind of hard to do to yourself um, because you have to be relaxed in order to do that. But I can sense the balance of the soft tissue uh, with regards to uh, how the, the kneecap is tracking. From a differential diagnose, a diagnostic standpoint, um, most of the time the knee is pretty normal looking. And so it's important that uh, the hip is ruled out as a cause for your pain because um, pain can radiate from the hip into the front of the knee. And you know, if you're treating your knee and treating your knee and treating your knee, and then you find out you've got some arthritis in your hip or inflammation in your hip, then that can be pretty frustrating. So test the range of motion of your hip. Um, and, the, and another sort of uh, relatively common issue um, that I find is missed is entrapment of the inferior branch of the saphenous nerve. The saphenous nerve is a sensory nerve. It's the term, one of the terminal branches from the femoral nerve. And it emerges between the sartorius and gracilis, which are two of the uh, hamstring adductors on the medial aspect of your knee. And sometimes this nerve will get impinged. Um, there can be anatomic variants. The vast majority, the nerve comes between the two muscles, but in a few people, that nerve actually comes out through the sartorius muscle. And as the nerve comes out through the adductor tubercle, it can become impinged, kind of uh, impinged, kind of like a carpal tunnel. Um, and you can, if you tap over the nerve, which would be just, um, just below the femoral condyle uh, medially, so on the inside of your knee, you may get a little tingling and burning feeling. Um, so that's just something to think about if you've been having anterior knee pain and there's not a lot to find and everything in the knee is normal and they've done all these tests and you're still, you know, struggling. Um, have your doctor test for this to see if it's, if it's the saphenous nerve. And, and then what you would do is you'd floss the nerve and you would get your uh, sartorius and gracilis uh, moving so that you can kind of release the nerve and unimpinge it. And oftentimes the symptoms will go away. So we've talked about the local issues around the knee, but to me, the, the, and, and that is important because we, will, um, we want to address tissue pliability issues around the knee and any inflammation around the knee. But to me, the real issue with anterior knee pain comes from elsewhere, that the knee is the victim of a problem in your hip and or your foot and ankle. And most of the time, it's both, both places. Um, and so uh, just as a reminder, the uh, body is structured so that the toes are mobile, the midfoot is stable, the, knee, the ankle is mobile, the knee is stable, and the hip is mobile. So if you lose mobility at the hip or the ankle, you're going to be increasing the forces on the knee and the most vulnerable structure is the patellofemoral mechanism. So I wanted to share a little bit of my own story um, I'm a bit of a tennis nut. I'm, I'm not giving my exact age here. I'm a little shy about that, but I'm, I am over 50, probably a little bit more over 50 than I'm admitting. Um, and I've had anterior knee pain intermittently since my teens. Um, I've always been really athletic. I played a lot of basketball as a kid. And um, I had times when I had to sit out for a couple of weeks because of pain in the front of my knee. Um, I had all the classic symptoms that we've already talked about, pain after sitting, uh, pain with stairs, pain when trying to sit. Um, and then when I was, uh, I got into medical school and my orthopedic residency, and I was so busy that I didn't have time to really play any sports. So uh, I just did a lot of running. So I would run to the hospital at five in the morning and have my shower and see my patients. And then I would either walk home that night, or if I was overnight on call, I would run home the next day. And I was doing zip as far as warming up 
cooling down. I wasn't doing any other kind of exercises. I was just running. And um, I had some, I didn't have a lot of issues, interestingly, during that period of time. But um, after I graduated and I became a staff person and I had a tiny bit more control over my life, and actually after my kids were born, um, a friend of mine said, you know, you always love tennis. Why don't you, why don't you take up tennis? You know, you need something to do to relieve stress. And, and I thought, that's a fantastic idea. So I started to go and play tennis. And then every once in a while, I would start having some pain around the front of my knee and it affected my left knee, my left knee. And um, I noticed, you know, when I had been teaching my patients how to activate their VMO, I, I noticed that I was really good at activating my VMO on, the, on my right leg, but I really had a hard time doing it on my left. And I kind of fiddled around with it and practiced it, but didn't really, um, I didn't really have time to focus on it at, at that, at that uh, moment in my life. And, um, and then I actually had an issue with back pain after my kids were born. And, um, and I think that sort of everything working together, I had a weak core after the kids were born. Uh, my glutes weren't functioning well on my left leg. Um, my, um, and because my, my glutes weren't functioning well, I, and my psoas wasn't functioning well, uh, I had a really tight rectus femoris muscle. And when I, when I would do a lunge or would I do a squat, I would have that dynamic valgus alignment. And, um, and my feet were kind of stiff and I had weak intrinsics. And so I kind of realized that I had these issues. And so I went and I did some of the traditional um, management. Uh, I iced my knee, I wore a compression sleeve uh, I went to, to a physical therapist, I did hip abductor strengthening and, and I found, you know, they would give me the clamshells to do and I, I would tend to cheat all the time I was always wanting to use, I would always want to flex my hip and use my TFL and instead of my hip abductors and uh, I never wore orthotics, I've never really believed in them. Um, and, and, and I used some kinesio tape and you know I really I was really frustrated because I, I would kind of get better. Um, I was doing some stretching. Um, they'd say stretch your psoas, stretch your rec fam. And it wasn't really working that effectively. And um, so I started doing some of my own active self myofascial release. Um, and that was really something that helped me before I would go out and play, but uh, play tennis. But what has made the massive difference for me is since I've met Eric, I met Eric um, a little over about a year ago. And I started doing Eric's exercises and it was like things, it was like a domino effect. Things started to fall into place. Um, I, I started to do the hip dissociation movements. Um, my glute was turned on better. Uh, and I think that the hip internal and external ex uh, rotation exercises that Eric does made a massive difference in my ability to activate my glute and particularly the glute med and min and get these muscles functioning more effectively. And I realized that, you know, as I was trying to do say um, uh, a, a squat or um, uh, a deadlift that I wasn't able to get my hip back into that, you know, little pocket that I talk about. And when I started doing these exercises uh, with uh, Eric, all of a sudden I could do a proper hip hinge. And with that happening, my, my, with my glutes functioning better, my hamstrings started to relax a bit, but what made a really massive difference was um, again, was when, uh, Eric taught me to actively flex my knees using my hamstrings. And then all of a sudden my rec fem started to relax. And at that same time, I think it was, I was doing the psoas uh, exercises. All of a sudden, because my psoas was flexing my hip instead of my rec fem, my quad settled down. And um, then the midline activator came into action. And I think that was um, a real game changer. So it was all of these things around my hip, um, being able to get my, my, or keep my hip centrated, get my hip posterior into a hip hinge, 
using my psoas, using my glutes, instead of using my rec fem and my hamstring in a way that shouldn't be used um, to support the hip, um, I, I, there was, the tension was then taken off of my knee. And also my foot, um, I found before I was doing these exercises that I had a hard time maintaining metatarsal pressure effectively. Um, once, once my hip was fixed, I had a much easier time doing the metatarsal pressure. Then I did the, oh, it's not a spring lunge, but a sprint lunge, uh, but we do want to spring and I actually can spring now. I'm really excited. Um, uh, I started doing the spring lunges, which uh, sprint lunges, which um, taught me again to incorporate that ankle dorsiflexion and the ability to push off effectively from my foot and ankle uh, again, took the pressure off of my knee and I have been working on core strength. So this, the, the exercises that Eric has are incredibly effective and it's a little bit complicated because, you know, you go through the process and you find that, okay, you know, I have a little bit of discomfort here. Um, and, um, it kind of migrates around sometimes as new tissues are being brought into the activity and the motion, but I've always felt better after I did the exercises. And when you look at all of these um, muscles that are being turned on, they're all at the back of the body, not at the front of the body. So as the back of my body became more effective in functioning, it allowed the front of my body to relax. And uh, it did take some time for the pain to go away completely in my knee, but I can now squat down, um, so that my knees are now flexed beyond 90 degrees. And I don't think I've been in that position since I was a toddler. So I'm pretty excited. So I thought um, if you were to have two goals in dealing with your anterior knee pain, from a movement perspective, it would be able to keep your hip centered and do a proper hip hinge and restore your ankle dorsiflexion. And I. Um, Eric did another live session um, Tuesday night, which was really fantastic. You know, thanks Eric for this. It was really great. Um, and one thing that struck home with me um, on, on that session is the, when your foot is dorsiflexed effectively, the gastroc can then also work at the knee to stabilize the knee. And if you see that here's the hamstring, it inserts on the tibia posteriorly and the gastroc inserts on the femur posteriorly and they form like a little X. And their job is to actually pull the femur or hold the femur and the tibia a bit more posteriorly. If they're not holding the tibia posteriorly when you contract your quad, you can be pulling the femur and the tibia into the patella almost. And so I think that some of these exercises that Eric has designed are really effective in creating a bit of space and taking the pressure off of your patella while you're achieving maximum flexion. Um, so again, we're always about trying to establish a foundation for movement. So figure out, feel around your knee, feel where it's a bit inflamed, feel where you have a tissue pliability issue, use your uh, active self myofascial release to take the pressure off that local tissue then you're going to activate your VMO and you're going to then get your hip working properly, your foot and ankle mechanics restored. And I can't say enough about the lower uh, limb control and hip control series for doing this. And um, there's also um, two live sessions that Eric has done that are, that are really helpful. And we can uh, hopefully discuss these a bit in the questions. So just, I'm almost done, but is there a role for surgery? Uh, very rarely, um, you know, what happens, you go in and you look, this, say this is the, this is, this is the, the patella, the undersurface, this is the femoral trochlea, this is normal cartilage, and there's a space here because the joint is distended with fluid. Um, so, sorry, that's normal. Then this is the fibrillation that I was talking about. You can see that there's some wear on, on the articular cartilage. This is the femoral trochlea. And then this is a little shaver where you'll go in and you'll debride the, um, the abnormal cartilage. And now what, instead of just leaving that um, and hoping that some new cartilage or fibrocartilage will form on the undersurface of the patella, 
There are some biologics that you can um, place into this area. They kind of stick like a glue uh, and will form a form of cartilage. It's not normal cartilage, but let's go back to why this problem began in the first place. The problem began because of imbalances around your patella and movement issues in your hip and your ankle. And if you don't fix those primary movement issues, then your surgical cartilage graft is just going to succumb to the same fate that your articular cartilage did in the first place. So my recommendation to people is fix your movement issue first, and then this may allow the cartilage to stabilize. There are a million people out there. I bet you my cartilage looks like this, actually this like shaggy, but I have no symptoms now. And that's because I've changed how I'm loading my knee, my kneecap. Um, so I recommend that you try this first and then, then and only if you absolutely can't live with it, that there is pinpoint pain directly under the kneecap. Um, your surgeon, uh, you know, has confirmed this, would I consider any kind of surgery? And I would think that um, probably 90, 95 to 99% of these patellar overload maltracking issues because of the imbalances related to movement can be fixed by changing how you move. Um, and that's all I have to say. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. B. As always, comprehensive, but simple to understand, uh, I think, for, and I'm assuming, but uh, just listening from kind of a non-science anatomy background, I think everything that you said, I think, um, can, is very understandable. So um, we've got a lot of questions, and you made some points there. I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to post some links in the chat in a minute. Okay. Of some of the resources that Dr. B had mentioned, like the exercises, midline muscle activator, um, the sprint start lunge is in the Rom Coach app. So go get the app if you if you don't have it. But that link is in the description. I'll post that stuff in the chat in a second. But uh, let's get to some questions because we've got some great questions today. Apologize, my neighbors just got. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering. I was wondering if that was your stomach rumbling. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in a minute. I, I'm a, I haven't had lunch yet, but I'm pretty good with the hunger. So uh, Alan has a few questions here. Let me see. Alan Lombardi, I've, how's it going, Alan? I've had anterior knee pain since early March. It's pretty, fairly, uh, not acute. The onset occurred during a heavy training load. Oh, that's the garage door. I don't know how loud that is, so I'm just going to pause while that's what's going on. Um, the onset occurred during a heavy training load period, but the instance was while I was just laying on the couch, sleeping. But I think my knee was in an awkward position. My doctor and PT have all but ruled out tendinopathy based on knee manipulations and my response to therapy. Can it be arthritis? It's gotten better, but won't go away. And a follow-up question, can a strained adductor opposite leg precipitate anterior knee pain? Okay, so um, Alan, the first question, can it be arthritis? How old are you? Um, it, it, the, the short answer, it could be some wear or pressure on the undersurface of the patella. Um, I wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, the message here is you got to change how you're loading the, the kneecap. So let's say you have a little bit of damage underneath the kneecap and you have that fibrillation. So long as you take the pressure off the kneecap, your patella is going to tolerate pressure without any symptoms. So just because you have an, a, a structural change in your body doesn't mean that you're doomed. It doesn't mean that you need surgery. It doesn't mean that you have to stop doing things. What it means is that you have to change how you're loading a part of the body. And then that fibrillation will either just remain very static, meaning it won't change or, uh, and it won't, so it won't progress. Um, or depending on, depending on how it's loaded, it could actually remodel a little bit. Cartilage has a very limited remodeling cap capacity because it has no blood supply. Um, but the bottom line is the it's a message to change how you're loading your uh, kneecap. Um, what was the second part again? <laughs> the second part. So Alan is 63. And the second part was, can a strained adductor opposite leg precipitate anterior knee pain? 100%. Because oftentimes what we find, and this is a, this is a really good point, Alan. Oftentimes, the non-injured leg becomes the problem child. Because if you don't treat 
the adductor injury on the other side, then your body then compensates by putting more load on the good leg. And so that's when these, um, some of these wear and tear issues will, will develop. So um, treat your adductor and there's lots of great exercises. Eric has loads of great exercises to, to deal with that. Yeah, I think the, what Dr. B mentioned, the midline muscle activator, that's a great one to start with uh, mm -hmm. to get, fire, get fired up and integrate it all in one, one fell swoop. So Alan, hopefully that has been helpful to you, my friends. Next up, and for anybody who's questioning the answer, if you have any follow-up information that you find is relevant, just post it in the chat and we can circle back to it uh, if, if we have time. Next up is Jazz. Pain more medial, but because of ankle instability, I've been told I need my hip manipulated by a podiatrist. Uh, that's interesting. Overpronation of foot causing the medial anterior knee area pain. Um, and I think it was just any comments or feedback. Well, so it's very common to have an ankle issue. I think actually my knee problems began after I sprained my ankle playing basketball. And um, so it's really important that you get the little intrinsic muscles in your feet uh, working properly. And um, I'm not sure why they think you need your hip manipulated, but um, certainly going through uh, your own active self myofascial release to make sure that you can make, uh, do a proper hip hinge to keep that hip posterior as you flex your hip is critically important. So um, if you need some direction and, and it's great to go and look at one exercise here and one exercise there that Eric has, but I really think that going into one of the programs, if it's a long-standing issue that you've had is beneficial because it gives you direction. It, no, it, it gives you the combination of exercises. It gives you goals of, okay, now I've achieved this. Now it's, now I'm ready to go to step two. So lower limb control would be a, a perfect uh, fix for you because it will address um, your movement issues that you're, you're describing. Right on. Um, Jazz, that link, if you're interested, can be found down in the description there. Um, and you can check out that course uh, if you so desire. Okay. Wendy Hartland. I've had intermittent sharp pains on inside of knees for years. I try to keep good alignment when exercising, etc. Don't think having one leg two centimeter longer than the other helps. Uh, <laughs> so no question mark. So that it's more of a statement, but Maybe you can speak to the fact of a two centimeter longer uh, leg and then medial knee pain. Yeah, so um, for sure, if you've got a, a two centimeter uh, leg length discrepancy, that's kind of getting into the realm of uh, creating issues. Uh, if we were to look at all of the general population, up to 15% of the normal population will have up to a one centimeter leg length discrepancy. And most people can compensate for one centimeter leg length discrepancy, but two is going to start throwing you off, uh, off balance. And so you may want to consider uh, getting your shoes modified so that you can equalize your leg length. Or, and I guess it depends a little bit on where the leg length discrepancy is coming from, um, but it will give you a pelvic obliquity, uh, obliquity uh, which will change how you're using your muscles and predispose you to knee pain. So. I would address the leg length discrepancy, uh, you know, understand where it's coming from, why it's there, and then take steps to equalize them so that you're not having to fight this battle for the rest of your life. Operate on the shoes, not on the body. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and this, um, and one thing just for, and this totally might not apply to you, but with respect to leg length discrepancies, there's two different types. There's functional and there's structural. So structural is, pretty much usually you're born with it and it's your bones and you're not changing your bones. But then a lot of people have the functional leg length discrepancies, especially those who get measured on a table. You go up on a table, a massage table, or your chiropractor's table, you bust out the tape measure, you measure it, so, you know, it looks, you know, it could be off. So there's a lot of error there. Um, and I think there's a lot of bias there as well to that can influence results, but the functional ones can be addressed and it's always worth addressing, trying to address it. Um, so if you have a functional leg length discrepancy, you wanna look at the whole side of that body. So it could be from the top that is pulling the hip up 
that is making it look like your one leg is a little bit shorter. So the measurement has to be really, really accurate. Um, but even if it is accurate, if it's functional, it's not something you were born with and you're not measured on uh, an x-ray, then work on this side of the body. It could be the QL, it could be obliques, it could be anything on this side, of the, it could be pecs, anything on this side of the body, in the back, lats, all of these side muscles. Simple way to test that out is just to do a big side stretch because that's going to globally just stretch out and lengthen all these muscles. And then you can see if your hips align you're standing in front of a mirror, you can see if your hips align a little bit better by doing a good 360 breaths, breathing into all that side, stretching it for 30 to 60 seconds, maybe 60 seconds just to do it as a test. Um, you might find you get some rebalance in there. And then the same thing applies to below the hip. It could be any of those muscles below the hip, like the whole thigh muscles, quads, hamstrings, gastrox, tib anterior. So one thing you could do there is just a decompression. So if you're lying down on your back, you have a, a strong rope or an elastic band attached to your ankle and get it to pull and hold that for 30 to 60 seconds. Same thing, breathe, try to relax, and then go in the mirror and compare. And you, and you might see some, some change there. Um, personally, I have my right side of the body due to my, my back surgery and the scar. Uh, it's, it is tighter or it's not as, it's shortened compared to my left side. So I do consistently work on that side a little bit more than my other side in terms of lengthening all those tissues. So just a, a side note related to this topic. Eric, that's an excellent point. Like really, really good. Like in, in orthopedics, we call it uh, an apparent leg length discrepancy or a true leg length discrepancy. And the way you can determine if it's true is you measure from a fixed point. So we measure from the anterior superior iliac spine to the tip of the medial malleolus if it's true. And I may, I answered the question assuming that it was a true leg length discrepancy, but you know, you're right. Uh, functional leg length uh, issues can be very common. So great tips. Thanks for that. Cool. Cool. Okay. Um, Caroline Chipsy, should squats be avoided completely then? And this is in relation to a point on one of your slides that showed the, the body weight mm -hmm. um, compared the forces going through the patella, I believe it was. Uh, I don't think if you have pain that squats should be um, avoided. The patella is actually made, made to be loaded. Um, they should be avoided if you're having pain. And um, what happens actually, once you really uh, squat down to the deepest portion is that the kneecap is just kind of sitting in front of the intercondylar notch. So you get through a zone where there is uh, a lot of load. But if your tissues are balanced, and you're not having any problem going through a deep squat, um, go for it. It's only if you're, if you're having pain, I would avoid it until you're able to create the balance and work towards achieving full mobility. Yeah, I would definitely echo that. And I would also say, um, in experiment with the way that you're squatting, because you may be able to find a technique that decreases the pain. So you're still able to squat, but maybe it's your weight distribution, more on the front, more on the back, um, using more of the hips. So you're getting more of the glutes and the psoas activated when you're squatting. That can take a, a lot of pressure and force off of the patella, uh, that getting the psoas activated because then the rec fem doesn't activate as much. So you take off the forces that the rec fem would add to the patella uh, when it's contracting strongly to do the psoas's job. So that's what made the big difference for me. It was getting the psoas functioning. Like it was like a massive difference uh, in my ability. Like I didn't have that butt wink anymore. And uh, yep. it, it was cool. Really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It is super cool. I've got an article on the butt wink. If anybody is thinks they have butt wink problems and they're stretching their hamstrings to till the cows come home. Is that still a saying these days? I, I use it. <laughs> is it? Okay. I use it too. Um, but it's not just, it's not hamstring. It's typically not hamstring issues. So if you want to search that article, I'll, I'll try to search it out and I'll post it uh, in the chat or the description in a sec. But uh, it's, it's more to do with so is inactivation and weakness. Okay, so let's move to the next question. Kiki Hood. I've had a meniscus repair six years ago, then a menis meniscectomy, menisectomy four years ago. <laughs> 
metastatomy. Now my knee hurts when I put weight on it. I hope I don't need another surgery. My kneecap sits slightly outside of the socket. It's been that way since birth. I've only had part of the meniscus removed. I've remained physically active. Will I still eventually need a replace knee replacement? Okay, Kiki. Well, the it's hard to know whether the pain is actually coming from the meniscal area of, or from the patella, but it, it's quite common for patients to experience anterior knee pain um, after surgery because the, the scope goes around the patellar tendon, around the fat pad, and sometimes there can be a little bit of inflammation and fibrosis in that area. Um, you are at risk for developing arthritis over time because you've lost part of your meniscus. But this is where I believe you should be proactive. This is going to be like brushing your teeth every day. You're going to want to look after your knees so that you can avoid um, overloading that part of your knee. And the way to av avoid overloading that part of your knee is to make sure that your ankles and your hips are functioning at their max. And if they're doing their job, then you're going to prevent the progression of arthritis and potentially avoid any surgery in the future ever. Um, but it, and, and it, look, if you end up having to have surgery, it doesn't mean you're a bad person and that, you know, the, but I would believe that if you take the proper steps, uh, you can delay it or slow it, uh, slow the progression of arthritis significantly. So I would encourage you to maybe do the ROM coach. It might be the best way to, um, assess what you're able to, to do. You go through the ROM coach. So there's uh, a series of movements that you do and you get a check mark. Yes, I can do it or no, I can't. And then you're assigned uh, exercises that you can put into your calendar. And if you're having issues in your lower extremity, um, the ROM coach uh, assessment is going to pick that up and will give you remedial exercises that you can do, which will help to prevent problems in the future. And, you know, it's not like you have to do 500 hours of exercise a day. It's really just trying to get that five or 10 minutes, which may seem like a lot, but it's a lot, it's a lot better than having a knee replacement, in my opinion. Right on. Um, yeah. So Kiki, if you didn't know, we have a, a mobile app called ROM Coach. So you can just search your, your app store and you can download that and you download it for free, get started and add a routine for free um, and take the assessment and all that stuff. So Definitely, definitely that. Uh, what do you think about the meniscus course, Doc? Because I think making sure that the fundamental um, movement of the patella with the patellar mobilizations you show, the VMO activations that you, you taught me and that you show in the course, um, what do you think about that? Just to make sure that that stuff is checked off. Not a bad, not a bad thing to do, um, yeah. for sure. Good point. It, I think that if, if Kiki's having, if the knee feels perfect, except for uh, this pain on occasion, then the ROM coach assessment maybe, uh, maybe would suffice. But if there's some swelling and if there's some lack of mobility um, and, and you know, you're, it just doesn't feel quite right in your knee, then the, uh, that's a great point. The knee meniscus course would be very beneficial. You get some really good tips. Um, and certainly if you ever get a flare in your knee, Kiki, if you you know, do too much one day and the knee swells up, then this would be a perfect go-to for you. Yeah, I, I think that would be a great idea because I, I'm, most people pre-post-surgery aren't doing the things that you you teach in that course um, okay. that you taught to all your patients, you know, before they would get on the table with you and then they wouldn't have to get on the table with you because, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah they, they would be pain-free. So I, I think that is, is the place to go. Um, Dr. B is just being humble with her, <laughs> of course, her recommendations here. Okay, so if there, again, if there's any other follow-up questions to any of our answers or follow-up info that you provide, throw it in the chat and we'll, we'll circle back. And there is one that I saw there. Um, I'll get to that next. Let's move on to um, Shabar. Shabar. Hello, Eric and Dr. B. I have right knee ACL tear. It's healing, but process is too slow. Um, tell us how long it's been, if you can. My first two pains, my first two pains a lot, unless I do stretch exercise, it will get normal. So there's a little bit of a, of a trans, uh, I think English is not the first language here, um, but ACL tear, slow healing. You, you can take this one. Okay. Um, 
So I wonder if that's the first time, uh, Shabar, that you've, in, you've been told that you have an ACL tear or whether this is a recurrent problem over your lifetime. Um, what I find is that when people have the acute injury, their knee swells up, becomes really uh, painful and swollen. You lose mobility. The kneecap can maybe is not tracking well. And um, if you just go out and you don't do anything to address the imbalances around your knee, uh, such as getting that kneecap moving properly, regaining range of motion, getting your VMO contracting, and uh, you, you don't do that. And then you go out and you try to play your sport or do your activities you're very uh, much at risk for having recurrent instability and having uh, your knee get, become painful and swollen and, and potentially damaging your knee. So I encourage you um, to take the steps here to get rid of your swelling, make sure your kneecap is moving properly, uh, make sure your VMO is turned on. And actually the meniscus course would probably be a very good one for you, even though um, it just talks, it's called meniscus the uh, initial steps that you take in the meniscus course would um, help you to get your knee to a point where you can then make a decision, do I need surgery or not? And uh, with ACL tears, the big risk is that you have recurrent episodes of instability and you tear a meniscus or you damage the articular cartilage and develop arthritis. So you want to avoid that. Uh, and plus every time your knee gives way, it's painful and, and you can't do what it is you wanna do. So I find that there's about a third of people who have an ACL tear who um, can do anything they want. On, and this has to do with how they're lined up and how they use their muscles. There's a third of people who can do their usual activities around the house, but they can't do any cutting or pivoting sports. And then there's a third of people who have trouble just managing with their usual activities of daily living. So um, the key thing, no matter what, whether you need surgery or not, is that you prepare your knee as best you possibly can so that you can then make a decision. When your knee is swollen and painful, you can't tell if you're having uh, a problem because it's swollen and, and, um, or whether the problem is because you have an ACL tear. So I would, I would recommend the uh, Avoid the Knife Meniscus Program for you at this point. Yep, and Dr. B and I just talked about this program. It's actually something that you can use for ACL tears, um, any ligament tears pretty much of the, of the knee to, to deal with that. So if anybody else is, is dealing with that, um, you can use that same program. We're, gonna, we're actually in the process of kind of rebranding it because the steps that you take to recover are, are essentially the same. And there's just some specific things that we're gonna add in for each specific condition. So um, hopefully that helps, Shabar. So the follow-up, to a previous one was Wendy Hartland who had the two centimeter leg length discrepancy. And she says, I've tried built up shoes. The length is in the femur, but it causes backache at age 60. So do you have any comments on that? So the buildup of the shoe is leading yeah. to the backache. So right. I wonder when you started using, um, I wonder if you have so many changes in your spine because you had a leg length discrepancy for years and years. Um, and if the backache is tolerable, what you might do is um, exercises for your spine to try and get the little joints in your back moving more effectively. So for example, if you've had this back, um, you've had the leg length discrepancy and this affected the alignment of your pelvis and your spine, you may have ligaments that are a little bit short and a little bit tight and muscles that are a little bit short and a little bit tight. And what has to happen is they need time to adjust to now their new alignment. So um, it's a little, it's, um, I don't know whether, what you think, Eric, whether the spine control or just trying damage control um, could be beneficial, um, but probably having somebody have a look to see, you know, where, where your issue is in the spine um, to give you some direction about um, how aggressive you can be with exercises to trying and induce the change would be beneficial for you. Yeah, I'm thinking if you had this age 60, the, the disc height might not be as malleable. Right. Um, so if it's a disc adaptation, throughout the spine that has resulted in, you know, angled discs essentially. Mm -hmm. And now you try to, I don't know if the malleability Unangle is, them. Yeah, if that would be, I mean, it's probably not gonna kill you, so you could try it. 
Um, I think I would go very slowly and I probably yeah. would wear, you know, it's a, it, the problem is, is that, you know, if you try maybe not having such a, a large correction, so yeah. instead of going the whole shebang to two centimeters, but maybe even just one centimeter to start with, and then don't wear, don't wear the shoe full time, but, and that's hard, you know, so maybe wear it only when you're at home for 15 minutes at a time so that you give your tissues a chance to adjust and to accommodate to the new alignment and the new changes. Um, it's a little hard to say without being able to feel your back and feel your tissues in this situation. But if it was me, uh, what I would do is probably um, not go for the full two centimeter correction. I would, yeah. um, then I would get my shoe and I would wear it around the house and I would sort of wean myself into it so that my muscles could adapt. Uh, I, I, I don't know if the discs will be permanently changed as a result of your leg length discrepancy for so many years, but I'm amazed at how our body can remodel and adapt. And I think that if you go slowly and smartly that you can eventually get through, get through this. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Um, okay, so hopefully that's helpful, Wendy. Next up we have Clar, Clar Track. I have chondromalacia patella stage four and I'm very flexible. You can drop your age in there. Um, everybody, if you ask a question, your age is actually very helpful for us. So just uh, post that if you've asked a previous question. Um, with chondromalacia, would your meniscus program be appropriate for me? I'm also bow-legged. Uh, if you have, um, if you're really, really sore and you're not uh, able to, like if you're limping, if you have swelling, if you're having trouble kind of walking up and down the stairs, the meniscus program would be beneficial uh, because it is going to teach you how to mobilize and balance your kneecap. Uh, it's gonna teach you how to activate the VMO effectively. Um, and it will then be a segue into say the lower limb control course uh, or hip control. Um, which are the ultimate things that you need to do to take the pressure off of your patella so that it's not so painful. So if you're really, really sore uh, and have limited mobility, I would do the uh, meniscus course. Uh, but if your mobility is pretty good and um, you have no swelling uh, and you think your kneecap is moving pretty well, uh, which probably it's a bit, a bit tight with the, the changes you're describing, um, uh, but if it's, it, you think it's moving pretty well, then I would just go to lower limb control. Cool. And those links you can find down in the description below this video. Um, okay, a couple more. This one, um, maybe you could clarify it for me, but let's see if Dr. B can pick it up. Meta, Metafit, uh, crepitus, the knee do resemble so mechanical fault. I'm not sure about that, but just crepitus in the knee. Mm -hmm. As biceps femoris share the common insertion with IT band, do you recommend ASMR? Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, I do recommend ASMR uh, for the biceps femoris and the IT band, even if you do have crepitation. Um, the crepitus, I'm assuming, is underneath the kneecap. Uh, you, sometimes there can be a soft tissue crepitus under the IT band. Uh, and you have to be a little careful about rolling directly on an area that's very inflamed. But what I would suggest, if you can, if you can um, picture the rope analogy where you've got a rope that's taut and then there's the worn area in the center and you're pulling on both ends of the rope and the, the damaged part of the rope would be where the inflammation is. If you can take the pressure off the rope by actively releasing above and below the area that's inflamed, then that gives the area that's damaged more opportunity to heal because you're not constantly pulling on it in a way that may be too much. So um, you might wanna do the active self myofascial release sort of above and below the uh, area that is inflamed on the biceps femoris and IT band. Yep, and maybe add some some plunging, plunging there too, eh? <laughs> oh God, cupping. Oh, oh my God, I, I didn't talk about cupping today. Actually, cupping is really great if you've got patellar tendonitis, um, and the IT band. I so I was taught this uh, when I was at a tennis tournament. Actually, one of the massage therapists she got this. Um, it's like a 
kitchen plunger and uh, you put a little bit of tremeal cream or any kind of like a massage cream on the side of your leg. And then you get that plunger and you stick it to the side of your leg and then you apply a little bit of suction and then you can pull the uh, plunger along your IT band from your knee up towards your hip. And it is the best way to release your IT band. It's, uh, it's quite something. <laughs> so take the plunge. <laughs> take the plunge, yeah. Yeah, I've taken the plunge and it's pretty cool. I think the combo of ASMR and the plunge is, is a really powerful, um, I guess, sequence or techniques to use together yeah. for IT band release. Okay, so let's see. Adriana had, she said the question's been answered, but I just want to share it. At what point in time is there a need for a knee replacement when you have a wear on the cartilage behind the kneecap? I've had knee pain for the past five years. Um, the comment I just wanted to make to that is, I, I shared a story before about there was a, uh, a lady who had imaging x-rays, I believe, on her knees, and it was found that she had little to no cartilage in both knees. She's in her 60s, um, and they had recommended a knee replacement, the doctor, the surgeon had recommended a knee replacement, but she had no pain whatsoever, no dysfunction, no limitations, no pain, super active, did tons of stuff, um, and she's like, why, why do I need surgery? Like, I feel great. Um, and she's just saying, here's the imaging. You have no cartilage. Uh, so maybe just your comments on that, Dr. B. Makes me crazy. <laughs> um, we don't operate on x-rays. We operate on people. And this is one of the things that um, I find very, very frustrating um, as a doctor uh, and understanding how important it is to correlate the history, the physical examination. So that means your symptoms, your story, and what we find on physical examination to what we see on an X-ray. If we were to do an MRI of everybody in the world uh, over the age of 50, we would find so many abnormalities, but we don't even know about them. So um, I, I really am a strong believer, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, go on what your symptoms are, but you'd look at the x-ray and you say, gosh, how come I don't have cartilage left in my knee? And if it's a wear and tear issue, how can I change how I'm loading my knee um, so that it doesn't become symptomatic? But I agree 100%. If it, 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 don't do an operation if you have no symptoms just because you have findings on an x-ray. And, and a little bit more info on that lady. She had a, a dance background. She was a dancer all through her youth. And into her adulthood. So she had great awareness of her body. She'd stayed active for her entire life. Hmm. Um, so that that is what will make the difference. Um, it's not just the condition or state of the stuff that is inside your body. Uh, what makes a huge difference in how you feel is how the stuff in your body works and getting that stuff functioning correctly. And we're made to move like we are. And, and so it's so important to keep moving correctly. And I think this is a message that, you know, Eric and I try to, um, to really teach. It's if you have some pain, don't stop moving, but change how you move, change how you're loading that part of your body and, and amazing things can happen. Yep. Um, okay, so we got, it's 114 here. I think we got time for a couple more questions. Uh, there's one I want to show a video of because we're getting a question about a VMO exercise. And so a little background. I never, I used to be one of the VMO skeptics that Dr. B was talking about because I went through the literature and I had experience in clinics, rehab clinics, um, where it was never something that, it, was, it wasn't taught to me as something that was important by the therapists that were working there. This is when I was a student in university. Um, and they went through, you know, glute media stuff, and clamshell and all those types of typical exercises. And it was until I met Dr. B and she, we were talking about a men the meniscus, how to heal the meniscus, because I had a torn meniscus. Um, and she taught me, she was talking about the importance of VMO. And because of who Dr. B is, I was like, okay, you know, I didn't believe it before, but I'm gonna listen to you and I'm gonna see what's, what you're saying. And then she taught me how to activate it. And it's funny because we were actually shooting the videos for the meniscus course. <laughs> And we we're going to do the VMO activation. We didn't practice it beforehand or anything. Dr. B gets me up on the table, on the massage table. Says, okay, now Eric's going to demonstrate VMO exercise. 
<laughs> we're sitting there, the camera's rolling, we're sitting there. I'm trying to activate my VMO and nothing is happening. So we're sitting there staring at my quad for about two minutes until something just goes like, blip, <laughs> I think. And they're like, okay. So that's a video that we had to, uh, we had to reshoot um, <laughs> and edit. But uh, now I wanted to share a video. I just took this the other day. It's funny that we're, we're doing this now. But uh, this is a video of me on the couch and my kids were hanging around and I was just sitting there. So I figured I might as well do something um, while they're playing nicely together. And I hope you can see this okay, but. Looks great. This is what a VMO activation looks like, a really basic one. I'm gonna pause the audio there. You can see that's what happens when the VMO activates. There's no rec fem activating. It's just that medial section of the muscle of the quadricep is firing up. And I do this regularly now just to, cause it's kind of cool. I show the kids, they kind of freak out because it's flickering <laughs> and stuff. Um, but some of the key points of when you're trying to do VMO activation is, and this is straight from the meniscus course and what Dr. B taught me, knee slightly bent, maybe about 20, 30 degrees, elevated on the pillow there. Ankle is dorsiflex, that can help. But I would say don't go into extreme dorsiflexion if you're doing the ankle. And then hip is slightly externally rotated. So you can't see it, but my, my leg, my hip is slightly externally rotated there. So that's what a VMO, an active VMO looks like. And your ability to consciously turn that thing on without co-contracting every other muscle in the quadriceps, I think is now, I believe, is something that is super valuable in a, a rehabilitation of any knee pain issue. Because Dr. B, why don't you talk about what happens to the VMO and people with injuries or knee pain or um, tears and stuff like that? Well, if, um, if you have pain in your knee and acute injury, and particularly if you get swelling, we'll see atrophy within 24 hours. And um, that to me is, um, it's a very important thing to recover. So even if the swelling and your pain goes away without, within 24 hours, uh, we know that, there, that the VMO has been affected. And the fact that the VMO has been affected then is going to change the quality of your quadricep contraction. And I believe that the VMO is very intimately connected to your adductor me mechanism, like that whole midline activator series. Um, and it's really an integral in, um, of integral importance in maintaining the stability um, of your leg, particularly as you move into flexion. But within 24 hours, you can see it atrophy and shut off. Yeah. And you know, from Dr. B's, this is why I, I was open to listening to her because her experience and her insight into, into these issues uh, is so, so unique. Um, so I was willing to, to listen to that. And because often I'm very stubborn and um, big headed, but uh, she, you can see it's clear that thing is, is meant to, to fire like every other muscle in the body. And I think the more that we can develop this, uh, I guess, precise control of our muscles and our musculoskeletal system and activating different things, uh, the better off, the better off we are. So. Well, I remember making rounds with uh, one of my mentors. Uh, we'd be at Mount Sinai Hospital and we'd have all these ladies who'd had knee replacements um, or osteotomy, like big operations on their knee and um, their knee would be very swollen. And we were supposed to go in and do a neurovascular check. So you wanted to see you know, if, if the nerves were damaged and I would always, I'd ask them to, you know, fire their quad and they couldn't fire their quad at all. And what's going on here? How come, how come they can't fire their quad? And I realized that it was just inhibited because of the swelling and the pain from the surgery. So then I would teach the people to start activating their quad. And the really striking thing to me was as soon as people could activate their VMO, their swelling would be under better control and their pain would go down. It's kind of like the body needs to have a purpose and know what it's supposed to be doing. And when you have a muscle, a muscle is meant to be used. And when you use it correctly, then you feel better. And I remember you, this, that was much better, by the way. You've really Thanks. gotten good at that. But um, it was funny because when we went back to shoot the, the next uh, VMO activation, I think Eric had been doing it like <laughs> on overdrive. And I swear his VMO had hypertrophied in the, in yeah. the week or two weeks that that um, in between, but you also made a comment to me that you did a lower extremity workout, I think some, some squats, and yep. that you noticed a difference in your, um, 
in your squatting uh, ability yeah. um, after your VMOs have been turned on. So I found that interesting. Yep, definitely. The it felt different because the VMO was active, and I I had developed through all the the work that I was doing on on activating the thing. I developed a better kinesthetic awareness of that muscle, so I could actually feel it when I was squatting, contracting, and being on, which was a, a new experience. And my knees, I felt better after after the squat session. It wasn't a crazy squat session. I was maybe squatting like 185 pounds or something. I didn't want to ramp it up too hard. I just wanted to focus on VMO, keeping it on during the whole um, workout. But it, it was definitely noticeable. So. Okay, um, so that's VMO. I think that was David who, who was asking about that. Um, so I think we have one more question. I'm going to get to that, and then I'm going to have to wrap up here. It's from Gary Finley, and he says, soft bump on outside of a knee and MM. I don't know if that's a typo and MM, um, but then how to deal with inflammation. So Sorry, what was the soft what? Soft bump on outside of knee and MM. It's uh, two letters, and I don't don't know if it's typo or if it's like and medial meniscus. Medial meniscus, sure. maybe. Possibly, um, but uh, how to deal with inflammation? Okay, um, the soft bump on the outside of the knee. Sometimes we see um, that can just be that you've got a quite a large effusion in the joint, and um, so they'll, you'll think that you have a bump on the outside of the knee, but that's actually part of the large joint effusion. Another explanation for bumps on the outside of the knee is you can have a meniscal cyst. So it's kind of like a ganglion um, that you'll see on the wrist. Um, but basically the best way to control swelling, in my opinion, is to uh, use a combination of ice and then this VMO activation. So you'll um, you do exactly what Eric just showed uh, and activate your VMO. Um, you, do, you do maybe... Uh, 10 different contractions of the VMO. First of all, just learning to turn it on. Um, and then uh, 10 contractions, ice, uh, rest, and then try to turn your VMO on, uh, say, if you do it first thing in the morning, then you do it at lunchtime, and then you do it before bed. Just to kind of, It's more important to do a little frequent um, um, bouts of turning it on and activating it, and that will really help control your swelling. Because the swelling shuts it off. So it becomes a vicious circle of being shut off and you want to turn it on and then you turn it on and the swelling is less. Um, and of course you have to modify your activities in between there. You can't go out and just start running a marathon. So you be smart and, and use your activity, uh, use swelling as how active you can be until you get your, your pain and swelling under control. And again, I'm, I'm going to say the meniscus course uh, you'll you'll want to have that because that'll walk you through different steps of and a little bit more than what Dr. B just shared in terms of teller mobilizations and things like that. That'll be helpful as you progress through and your swelling starts to decrease. decrease. You'll want to do some other things to ensure everything is is activated and moving properly before you get into your activities full on and your sports and working out and all that stuff. Uh, so link down in the description below. Definitely highly recommended there. Um, here's one car track, just a follow up. Please recommend all programs for me. Right pelvis anteriorly rotated and tilted, right hip labral tear plus FAI, bow legged, both knees, chondromalacia patella, stage four plus medial, medial compartment, stage four. Um, I think you should do the ROM coach assessment, and then that will give you some direction. Um, but but the lower extreme, lower limb control and hip control would, would, really, really help you from a treatment standpoint. Uh, the ROM coach, I, I, you know, it, it's gonna give you some guidelines, but hip control and lower limb, uh, or lower, or lower limb control would be excellent uh, for you. And I mean, this goes to the fact, I have said this a few times, or I've said this a few times for sure, where um, when there's an issue, you're gonna start somewhere. If you've got an issue in your hip, you'll probably start with your hip but you're always going to have to move to the rest of the body. Um, at some point, you got to make sure everything is functioning correctly because an issue in one area can manifest in pain and injury and dysfunction in another area. And if it's left for long enough, and we're all, you know, most of us here are 40 plus, I would say, the majority of the people who find their way to precision movement and these chats and the YouTube channel, but that's, 
potentially decades of time where compensation can start, you know, dysfunction can start here and then the compensations layer on top of each other like an onion. So you start somewhere and then just branch out from there. Um, that's why yeah. one, one thing with the, the ROM coach, it's, it's great for maintenance and hitting things, waking up different muscles that might not be working because there's a lot of unique exercises and things we talk about. But the, the precision movement courses, that whole series, the control series, it hits every joint in the body. So if you do that and go through that whole thing, and I would recommend it usually takes about a year, anywhere from if you're really um, adamant about it, you can get it done in maybe eight months. But eight months to a year, you can go through all those courses as they're designed. And that will take you through the progress. Our four R's are steps that you want to go through for each joint to make sure that it's going from, okay, let's get muscles on and activated and restore and then restore mobility, restore strength, function. Um, that's That was my ultimate vision for designing the control series is to have people go through the whole thing so that at the end of it, it's like, okay, I've done my best to, to get back and hey, look, I, I feel pretty good at the end of that. Who knew? Yeah, it's it, and I agree with Eric. It's um, be, and this is about movement longevity. We're trying to help people to keep moving and doing everything they love to do for as long as possible. And um, I think that um, the beauty of the courses and the exercises is that um, they're very unique because they trick you into turning the right muscles on in a way that you don't even realize. And and um, I can attest to the changes that I've had and recovery from my knees uh, since doing the course. It's, it's really exciting. Um, no, it was excellent. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, one last question and then we'll, we'll wrap it up because it's relates to what we were just talking about uh, a little bit from Lee Lord. Should I wait for my knee pain to go away before doing strength training? Well, I think that it's really important that you work above and below it. So the short answer would be no. Start doing something that you can tolerate. I mean, I'm not asking you to go and to beat a hammer on your knee. What I want you to do is, um, if you're really that painful, you may check out the meniscus course because it's going to give you uh, things that you can do that will actually help your pain to go away faster. And then um, while your knee is remodeling, while it's healing, while um, inflammation is settling down, you focus on your hip or your ankle or both so that you can be doing some gentle exercises to turn muscles on, to release muscles above and below so that when your knee is healing, then you're ready to start progressing um, and you're preparing your body to really then start training. Um, but we want you to uh, lay the groundwork. So keep moving. It's movement will dictate um, so many important things uh, in the remodeling process that if you just lay there and you don't move at all, um, the healing response is less organized and then you'll have more work to do in the end. Um, and you're going to get other aches and pains from lying around. So with common sense, keep moving. Yeah. And from, from a strength training perspective, if it's your knees that are painful, for example, and squats bother your knees, then don't, don't do squats. Um, don't load them up to try to push for that one RM or because your strength training program dictates you should be adding five pounds this week. Um, that's where you got to use your common sense, but keep, you know, do your upper body stuff, do your core work, work on the things that Dr. B is talking about, work on the meniscus program if you, knee, if you got some knee issues going on poor activation of the VMO and that kind of thing. So you got to keep moving as much as possible, but anything that causes the pain that is, has you thinking that you want to stop, don't do those things. Right. Yeah. So just a little uh, public service announcement on that one. <laughs> okay. So I think that's, that's it for, for us today. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. B for, again, for doing these. You're awesome. And your info is always so, so great for, for everybody here. Uh, I hope if you've got if you've got knee pain or if you know people with knee pain, send this to them because this could really, they're getting different messages from different people and different info. This is, I think Dr. B does such a good job at consolidating everything that you know, people might hear things here and there and there, um, but it's all in one package and is it has a unified message, which I think is really important in today's age of Google and 
millions of pages on every topic, uh, it can get really confusing and overwhelming. So yeah, Dr. B, thank you again. Well, and thank you, Eric. It was a lot of fun. Okay. Yeah, it's always good times. Um, we are on next week, Thursday at noon. Uh, we haven't picked what we're going to talk about, but we will do that. Make sure that you're subscribed to the YouTube channel and the email newsletter we, is where we send out notifications of what the topic is going to be uh, uh, about and reminders about it as well. So sign up at precisionmovement.coach for the email newsletter. Trust me, it's not full of spam and garbage and just stuff to buy, uh, shove down your throat. It's, we try to make it packed with good info. So thanks again, everybody, and hope to see you next time. Take care. Thanks, everyone.